Chapter 18 of the Americans is entitled Cold War Conflicts, the U.S. versus the USSR. The origins of the Cold War are described in Chapter 18.1. After being allies during World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union, USSR, soon viewed each other with increasing suspicion. Their political differences created a climate of icy tension that plunged the two countries into an era of bitter rivalry known as the Cold War. The Cold War would dominate global affairs from 1945 until the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. The, at the heart of the Cold War was the tension uh, based upon fundamental differences in the political systems of the two countries. The United States calls itself a democracy that has a capitalist economic system, says it has free elections, and claims to have two competing political parties, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. In the Soviet Union, there is only one political party, the Communists, which established a totalitarian regime with little or no rights for the citizen. And there's overwhelming evidence that this is true. The suspicions between the two nations developed before World War II, as we saw in the 1920s with the Red Scare. But even during the war, the two nations continued to disagree on many issues. The U.S., had been furious that the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, had been an ally of Hitler for a short time before general war broke out. Stalin was upset that the United States had kept its development of the atomic bomb a secret. The United Nations was created after the end of World War II to attempt to avoid an outbreak of hostilities and save lives. High hopes for world peace were high at the end of the war. The most visible symbol of these was the United Nations. It was formed in June of 1945, and the UN was composed of 50 nations. There were five nations selected to be on the Security Council. Each of those five nations was given the right to veto anything that they saw as a threat to their own security. These five nations included the United States, the Soviet Union, England, France, and China. Unfortunately, the United Nations soon became a forum for competing superpowers to spread their influence over others. With nuclear weapons in the hands of the Soviet Union and the United States, modern war couldn't be conducted as it had been prior to this. And so the Cold War is a new type of war in which smaller nations were influenced through money and through direct military intervention in the hopes that the world would be divided into two camps. The First World which is allied to the United States, the Second World, which was allied to the Soviet Union, and any other states not, a, not in alliance were known as Third World Nations. The Soviets dominated Eastern Europe. After suffering an estimated 20 million deaths in World War II, half of whom were civilians, the Soviets felt that they deserved to have a buffer between them and the rest of Europe to prevent another invasion of their country, of which they had suffered two in the last 20 years. They claimed an empire in Eastern Europe, stretching from Denmark in the north to the Adriatic Sea in the south. Stalin installed puppet governments in these nations. They were satellite communist governments in Eastern European countries of Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, and East Germany. After this, this was after he promised free elections in Eastern Europe at the Yalta Conference, betraying that promise in the name of national security. Here you can see a map showing how Europe was divided between the Soviet Union and 
and the allied Western Bloc nations, the red line showing the Iron Curtain, an imaginary wall between these two governments. The United States established a policy of containing the Soviet expansion in Europe because of the threat of World War III. Faced with the Soviet threat in Europe, President Truman decided it was time to stop babying the Soviets. And in February of 1946, the American diplomat in Moscow, George Kennan, proposed a new type of policy containing the Soviets everywhere they tried to spread their influence. This would require a worldwide global police force run by the United States and supported by her allies. Containment meant that the U.S. would prevent any further extension of communist rule anywhere in the world at whatever cost. Winston Churchill first described the, divi the division of Europe as an iron curtain into two political regions. In a 1946 speech, Churchill said, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. The phrase, iron curtain, came to stand for the division of Europe. Here is a cartoon showing Winston Churchill kneeling down with his characteristic cigar, peeking underneath the Iron Curtain that separated Western and Eastern Europe. The Order of Joe would be Joseph Stalin. The Truman Doctrine was the American policy of containing the Soviet expansion. This doctrine was first used in Greece and in Turkey in the late 1940s and it vowed to provide money and military supplies to support, quote, free peoples who are resisting outside pressures. In another sense, this is the United States funding rebel armies and military takeovers of any country that it doesn't see as friendly to its interests. Even democratically elected leaders could be overthrown by the Truman Doctrine, because it's a blindness to the reality in favor of seeing communism in every corner of the globe. By 1950, the United States had given $400 million in aid to Greece and Turkey. The Marshall Plan was a plan to deal with post-war Europe, which was devastated economically after the war. In June of 1947, Secretary of State George Marshall proposed a aid package to European nations. Western Europe accepted the help, while Eastern Europe, meaning those countries controlled by Stalin, rejected the aid. Over the next four years, 16 European countries received $13 billion in U.S. aid. And by 1952, Western Europe's economy was flourishing. One of the reasons Stalin and the rest of Eastern Europe rejected the aid from the United States was because by accepting the money and the aid, the economies of those nations would become dependent upon the United States economy in the long term. Countries like France, England, and Germany all became uh, satellite nations of the United States, just as Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Romania became satellite nations of the Soviet Union. Here you can see how the American Marshall Plan uh, was spread about, with the majority of the money going to England and France and Italy, but also large amounts going to countries like West Germany uh, and Greece. The Marshall aid uh, was symbolized in this cartoon of a basketball going into a hoop of European recovery with the basketball player of Joseph Stalin and the question of whether he could block it. The superpowers began to almost immediately struggle over control of, of Germany. At the end of the war, Germany was divided among the Allies, England, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States, into four zones for the purpose of occupation. 
the U.S., France, and Great Britain decided to combine their three zones into one zone, Western Germany, or the Federal Republic of Germany. The Soviet Union controlled East Germany, called the German Democratic Republic. Now the superpowers were occupying an area right next to each other, and problems were bound to occur. When the Soviets attempted to block the three Western powers' access to the strategic city of Berlin, which was inside of eastern Germany, in 1948, the 2.1 million residents of West Berlin had only enough food for five weeks, which would have resulted in a dire situation. Stalin was attempting to force these sections of the city to submit to his rule. Not wanting to invade and start a war with the Soviets, America and Britain started the Berlin Airlift to fly supplies into West Berlin. For 327 days, planes took off and landed every few minutes around the clock. In 277,000 flights, they brought in 2.3 million tons of food, fuel, and medicine to support the West Berliners. The Soviets lifted their blockade in May of 1949 after suffering a public relations nightmare. The Berlin blockade increased Western Europe's fear of Soviet aggression. As a result, ten Western European nations joined with the United States and Canada on April 4, 1949, to form a defensive alliance known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, also known as NATO. While it was originally meant to be a defensive alliance, and it served that purpose until the end of the Cold War in 1991, today NATO is very much an aggressive alliance of Western powers, and we've seen NATO lead the way in invading Afghanistan in 2003 and Libya in 2009. Section 2, The Cold War Heats Up. China, for two decades, the communist Chinese had struggled against the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek. The nationalists were notoriously corrupt and brutal to the Chinese people. The U.S., of course, supported Chiang and gave the Nationalist Party $3 billion in aid during World War II. This was done primarily secretly so that Stalin would not notice the Allied support for the enemy of his fellow communist Mao Zedong and the Communist Party in China. Because of the overwhelming popularity of the Communist Party in China and the brutality and corruption of the Chinese Nationalist Party, Mao was especially popular amongst the Chinese peasants and eventually would win the Chinese Civil War. After Japan left China at the end of the war, Chinese nationalists and communists fought each other to a bloody civil war. Now, despite the U.S. sending billions of dollars to the nationalists, the communists under Mao won the war and ruled China. Secretary of State Alan Dulles described this as the greatest foreign policy failure in American history, because just three years after the uh, declaration of the Truman Doctrine, in which the United States pledged to stop the spread of communism everywhere in the world, China had become communist. When China became communist, one out of every five people in the world was now a communist. Chiang and the nationalists fled China to the neighboring island of Taiwan, also known as Formosa. Mao established the People's Republic of China, and it is still called that today. And these two island uh, enemies remain deadlocked in a Cold War conflict even now. The United States public was shocked that China had fallen to the communist. After all, the United States believed, or at least its people did, that we were 
unstoppable after our victory over the Japanese and over the Nazis. Many believed that containment had failed and that communism was now expanding. The idea of an enemy expanding despite the best efforts of the United States terrified many Americans. And this fear of communism and communist expansion increased in the minds of the public and allowed the military and political leaders of the country to justify increasing expenditures of billions of dollars to fight this imagined threat, as well as the uh, loss of many essential rights of the American people. Japan had taken over Korea in 1910 and ruled it until August of 1945. As World War II ended, Japanese troops north of the 38th parallel surrendered to the Soviets. Japanese soldiers south of the 38th parallel surrendered to the Americans. As in Germany, two nations developed, one communist, North Korea, and one arguably democratic, known as South Korea. I say arguably democratic because while it claimed to be democratic, the United States essentially installed military dictatorship in South Korea that would stay in place from 1945 until 1988, in which numerous military strongmen ruled the country, torturing and murdering its citizens while maintaining a hostile position against North Korea. The Korean War began on June 25, 1950, when North Korean forces swept across the 38th parallel in a surprise attack on South Korea. With only 500 U.S. troops in South Korea, the Soviets figured the Americans would not fight to save South Korea. Instead, America sent troops, planes, and ships to South Korea, realizing that this was a justifiable continuation of the massive military expansion that had happened during World War II. It gave us an argument for continuing to take away rights and spend billions of dollars of taxpayer money in a conflict that most Americans didn't understand and didn't see as a threat to American interests. At first, in the Korean War, North Korea seemed unstoppable. However, General MacArthur launched a counterattack with tanks and heavy artillery and troops, landing at Incheon, just southwest of Seoul. Many North Koreans surrendered, and others retreated across the 38th parallel, but not before they burned Seoul to the ground. As the United States pushed the North Koreans further and further closer to China, the United States burned down just as many cities, murdering just as many civilians, if not more, than the Korean nationalists did, uh, as the communists did in their retreat. All in all, close to somewhat three million Koreans died as a result of the conflict between the North and South Korea. The conflict in North Korea uh, took a decided turn when China entered the fight. Just as it looked as the Americans were going to win in the North, 300,000 Chinese soldiers joined the war on the side of the North Koreans. The fight between the North and South had turned into a war in which the main opponents were Chinese communists and the United States. To halt the bloody stalemate, General MacArthur called for an extension of the war into China and argued strongly that the United States should use its massive nuclear armaments to wipe out the Chinese people in a genocide that would make the Holocaust seem small by comparison. President Truman, realizing this murderous, bloodthirsty rage, rejected the general's requests. MacArthur continued to urge President Truman to attack China primarily with nuclear weapons and even tried to go behind the general's back. This reflects the growing independence and power of the American military establishment after World War II 
with so much being spent on the military and so much power in the military's weapons, the military began to even question the value of a democratic leadership in the United States. And Truman's efforts to go behind the back of MacArthur's efforts to go behind the back of President Truman reflect this military uh, takeover that the United States was threatened by. On April 1st, 1951, Truman made the shocking announcement that he had fired General MacArthur. Americans were surprised, and many still supported their fallen general. This is evidence of the overwhelming militarism and nationalism that the United States continued to have even after two world wars in which militarism and nationalism led the world into bloody conflicts in which millions of people died needlessly. Negotiators in Korea began working on a settlement as early as the summer of 1951. Secretary of State Alan Dulles finally reached an agreement in July of 1953 that the war would end as a stalemate, with the North and the South essentially stopping exactly where they had begun at the 38th parallel. Dulles was able to achieve this by threatening China and North Korea with the use of nuclear weapons if they did not sign the armistice. The war cost 45,000 American lives and $67 billion. Very little was gained, and most Americans didn't see the point. The Cold War at home is dealt with in Section 3 of Chapter 18. At the height of World War II, about 80,000 Americans claimed a membership in the Communist Party, because, of course, the First Amendment grants all Americans the freedom to participate in any political party that they choose. Some in this country feared that the first loyalty of these American communists would be to the Soviet Union. Overall, Americans feared communist ideology, a world revolution, and Soviet expansion. And therefore, we can see the return of fear used to divide the American people along political lines. It's a very powerful and effective tool, one that we saw in the 1920s used very effectively by Woodrow Wilson. The United States government took action, and in March of 1947, President Truman set up the Loyalty Review Board. The board was created to investigate federal employees and to dismiss those disloyal to the United States government. How they determined disloyalty was imaginary, most of the time merely uh, firing individuals based upon gossip, uh, innuendo, or lack of evidence completely. But because fear was such a powerful motivator, the government could fire individuals and claim they were communists, utterly destroying their lives and their chance for future employment. Because after all, if the government doesn't trust you, who else will trust you? The United States Attorney General drew up a list of 91, quote, subversive organizations, and membership in any of these was grounds for suspicion. Suspicion was grounds for firing and loss of, um, uh, loss of home ownership, loss of loans, loss of uh, economic opportunity, essentially a social and economic death sentence. When the idea of a subversive organization is one that doesn't exist under the Constitution of the United States because under the First Amendment we have the right to freedom of association. You can freely associate with a, any organization and the government is not supposed to harm you in any way. However, the House Un-American Activities Committee was a government body formed to investigate communist influences in the movie industry, after the world wars, uh, both in the 19-teens and in the 1930s and 40s, the government realized how powerful Hollywood would be in developing a, a manipulation over the minds of the American people. And it wanted to make sure that the people in Hollywood would do exactly as the government wished. The committee claimed that communists were sneaking propaganda into films. Uh, this was uh, ironic, considering that the government had been paying for propaganda films supporting communism, our ally, in World War II. 
The House Un-American Activities Committee subpoenaed witnesses from Hollywood to discuss their involvement in communist activities, asking them, are you now or have you ever been a member of a communist organization? Ten witnesses refused to cooperate because they rightly believed that the proceedings were unconstitutional and they were jailed. Subsequently, the committee blacklisted 500 actors, directors, writers, and producers whom they believed had communist connections. The blacklist ten and two lawyers never worked again in Hollywood. Their families couldn't get jobs. Their friends couldn't get jobs. They couldn't receive loans to buy houses or to start businesses. They essentially were finished in the United States because they refused to cooperate with an unconstitutional government witch hunt. This is reminiscent of the purges of the Stalin, of, of, by Stalin in the Soviet Union and, of course, the persecution of any minority under fascism. The United States is just as likely to abuse minorities in the name of power as any other group in world history. A spy case caught the attention of the nation and, wrote, and created a new political superstar. Two spy cases added to the fear gripping the nation. Alger Hiss was accused of being a spy for the Soviet Union, and a young congressman, Republican named Richard Nixon, gained fame by tirelessly prosecuting Alger Hiss. Hiss was found guilty and jailed, and less than four years later, Richard Nixon was named the Vice President of the United States. Another spy case involved the Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel. The Rosenbergs had worked on the atomic bomb project in 1949, and the, uh, they were accused of passing information to the Soviet Union. Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were found guilty, and both were executed. Evidence later released showed that there might be some reason to believe that Julius Rosenberg had given nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union. He believed that with the United States being the only nuclear superpower, that this would lead to worldwide domination by the United States. And looking at our actions against China and the North Koreans, it is arguable that he was right the ultimate power would have led to the ultimate abuse of power by the United States. For his desire to stop the United States from becoming a worldwide dominant superpower, he was executed. There is no evidence that his wife, Ethel, was involved in any way, and yet she too was executed, leaving both of their children orphans. The most famous anti-communist activist was Senator Joseph McCarthy, a Republican from Wisconsin. McCarthy took advantage of people's concern about communism by making unsus unsupported claims that 205 State Department members were communists. Because of the rampant fear and hatred towards communism at the time, this made McCarthy a very powerful congressman, and he continued to make unsubstantiated claims about communists taking over the government from within. And as long as he did, he, was gain he gained more and more of a national following. Here are some pictures of movies that were created in the 1950s showing just how scared people were of communism during the McCarthy era. Communism, America's mortal enemy, shows a dagger plunged into the middle of the United States. I married a communist actually argued that uh, your wife or husband might be an enemy and you shouldn't trust them. This is exactly the same type of paranoia that Stalin used against his own people when he encouraged them to turn in their own parents if they didn't support Stalin. We, however, did the same thing, only in reverse, arguing that if you felt that your wife or husband was a communist, you should be very afraid and not even trust them. Perhaps even destroy them. McCarthy ultimately uh, fell from power when he went too far by accusing high-ranking army officers of being communists. Remember that the United States military was now flush with hundreds of billions of dollars in money and held nuclear weapons. 
and they were backed by a population that was strongly militaristic and nationalistic after World War II. In televised proceedings, McCarthy bullied witnesses, and this ultimately alienated the national audience. In fact, a high-ranking military officer effectively had destroyed his national reputation by saying to Joseph McCarthy, quote, At long last, sir, have you left no sense of decency? This meant that by making allegations without any evidence and manipulating people by fear is an indecent and un-American thing to do. However, it works. And today we still see people arguing that Joseph McCarthy was doing the right thing. Three years later, however, Joseph McCarthy dies of alcoholism at age 49. Today, those congressional wish hunts and episodes of red baiting are universally discredited as an abuse of official power. The history of the blacklist era has come to stand for demagoguery, censorship, and political despotism. And the blacklisting, persecution, and jailing of American citizens for their political beliefs, or their perceived political beliefs, is regarded as a shameful chapter in modern American history. However, today, the government still continues to try to jail people for their political beliefs, as we will see with Daniel Ellsberg in 1971, and today with Bradley Manning, who released uh, government uh, evidence showing war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan, and furthermore, to journalists like Julian Assange, who published those evidences of war crimes, all of which the United States wishes to see them jailed, silenced, and hopefully executed. So, because we do not learn of our past mistakes, the government continues to try to bait us through demagoguery, censorship, and political despotism. Chapter 18, Section 4, Two Nations Living on the Edge. After World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union competed in developing atomic and hydrogen bombs. The Soviets tested their first atomic bomb in 1949. The United States began to work on a bomb 67 times stronger than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. This is known as the hydrogen bomb, and you can see a picture of it tested at the Bikini Island in the Pacific Ocean in 1954. The Bikini Islands were selected because they were so far away from large population centers. However, like the Native Americans before them the, uh, and other minority groups, the United States military did not respect the Native population of the Bikini Island and literally forced them at the point of a gun to leave their ancient homeland so that we could use it as a nuclear testing site. Brinksmanship by the time both countries had the hydrogen bomb in 1953, President Dwight Eisenhower and his Secretary of State John Foster Dulles made it clear that they were willing to use all military force, including nuclear weapons, to stop Soviet aggression. The Soviets followed suit. However, they never claimed that they would be the first to fire a missile. They stated repeatedly that they would never be the first to launch a nuclear attack. The United States claimed the right to launch a surprise nuclear attack upon any country it wished at any moment. This willingness to go to the edge of all-out war became known as brinksmanship, going to the edge of nuclear annihilation. And here's a photograph showing some Americans who created shelters in their backyards in case of a nuclear attack. It makes it seem almost cozy inside. Imagine living the next 50 years inside that tin can, because the radiation would require it if you wish to survive. But most likely, these people would die of starvation long before then. This shows how most Americans didn't realize just how over the edge their government had become with power-crazed leaders using super weapons to pursue ideological threats. The Cold War spread as the U.S. began to depend upon more and more information compiled by the Central Intelligence Agency, an agency developed by Harry S. Truman and expanded by President Eisenhower. The CIA began to attempt to weaken or overthrow governments uh, unfriendly to the United States. Notice the word unfriendly doesn't necessarily mean undemocratic. Undemocratic. 
the United States began to overthrow any government anywhere, about, uh, democratic or not, if it didn't do what the United States wanted. This is ultimately an undemocratic, illegal policy created for an unethical, illegal organization known as the Central Intelligence Agency. The first operation occurred in the Middle Eastern nation of Iran. Iran had a democratically elected government under Mohammad Mossadegh, and in 1953, because of the oil wealth in that country, the United States orchestrated the overthrow of the democratically elected government and put into place the pro-U.S. Shah of Iran, who then proceeded to brutally torture and murder his people for the next 26 years, until in 1979 the Iranian people overthrew the Shah and put into place the most anti-American government in the world, the Iranian government. This shows how the United States people are often left ignorant to the actions of the United States government when it acts unethically and counter to American interests in the name of oil wealth and political domination. The Shah is a dictator. The United States created him. The United States undermined democracy. The United States betrayed everything the United States is supposed to support. Other covert actions that were taken by the Central Intelligence Agency took place in Guatemala, a Central American country just south of Mexico. The United States believed that Guatemala was on the verge of becoming communist, so the CIA trained an army which invaded the small country. The actions eventually failed, and a military dictator rose to power. The country did, never became communist, and the United States didn't respect its democratic ability to choose its own leaders, thereby establishing the idea that the United States does not respect democracy anywhere in the world, and actually prefers military dictatorship. Here's a cartoon making fun of the Central Intelligence Agency. Look carefully at the name Central Intelligence Agency and you'll see why this is a cartoon making fun of the Central Intelligence Agency. To counter US, the U.S. Defensive Alliance and the United States' aggression against innocent countries around the world, in 1955 the Soviet Union formed their own mutual defense alliance known as the Warsaw Pact. The countries in red form the Warsaw Pact, while the countries in green form the NATO alliance. Dominated by the Soviet Union since the end of World War II, the Hungarian people rose up in revolt in 1956. Led by Imre Nagy, the liberal communist leader of Hungary, the people demanded free elections and the end of the Soviet domination. The Soviet response was swift and brutal. 30,000 Hungarians were killed, including Nagy, as the Soviets reasserted control. The United States could have come to the aid of free peoples, as the Truman Doctrine said it would, but it did not. This proves that the Truman Doctrine is not, as it says, a doctrine that seeks to support free peoples who are suffering under communist dictatorship. The Truman Doctrine, in a sense, is a farce, an illusion, that allows for the massive expansion of American military spending and the not denial of American civil liberties and rights at home in, the, uh, in exchange for uh, nothing. The Cold War takes to the skies. The space race was initially dominated by the Soviets, who in 1957 launched Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik traveled around the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour, circling the globe every 96 minutes. In the late 1950s, the CIA began high-altitude spy missions over Soviet territories, including the Soviet Union, and here you can see a photograph of one of those spy planes. The U-2's infrared cameras took pictures of Soviet troop movements and missile sites. The idea was to uh, scare the Soviets by uh, 
presenting a plane they could not stop and invade their uh, national sovereignty repeatedly. This is, of course, a violation of international law and ultimately an act of terrorism by the United States. On May 1, 1960, Gary Powers was piloting his U-2 spy plane over Soviet territory and claims he was shot down. However, the story is important to understand in terms of General Eisenhower, who uh, just a few months before leaving the presidency was planning to negotiate the end of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Because the CIA did not want to see the end of the Cold War, Gary Powers actually crashed his U-2 spy plane in Soviet territory. Powers parachuted into Soviet territory, was captured and sentenced to 10 years in prison. And because of this incident, the 1960s did not open with the end of the Cold War, as Eisenhower had hoped, but with increased tension between the superpowers. The CIA and the military had effectively designed a way to prevent peace in the name of increasing their power and prolonging the, expense, the, the massive expense of militarism in the United States. They would lose their money, they would lose their power, if the Cold War ended. Eisenhower tried to stop it, they sabotaged Eisenhower. 